What is up, Iwu crew? Today, we are covering the brutal case of convicted killer Jeremiah Bean. Our story begins many years ago in the small town of Fernley, Nevada, on May 10th, 2013. Tucked inside of Lyon County, the city of Fernley is home to a little over 20,000 people. It was an exceptionally average Friday afternoon for local residents Robert and Dorothy Pape. Like any other Friday, the 84-year-old retired couple spent their time tending to their home and preparing for the potential Mother's Day weekend celebrations to come. Robert Pape spent a large part of the afternoon doing yard work in the Nevada sun, while his wife enjoyed a midday nap in their shared bedroom. The desert air was stuffy, but the day was otherwise like any other for the Papes. That is, until an unexpected guest let himself in to their quaint Lyon County home uninvited. As Robert Pape began to finish up his work in the couple's front yard, 27-year-old Jeremiah Bean walked through an unlocked door and into the Pape's living room. At the time, Jeremiah Bean had been fresh off an expired parole for a burglary charge six months before stepping into the Papes' residence. Bean had been considered a juvenile delinquent in the state of California before serving time in Nevada prisons for burglary. During his parole, Bean began to associate himself with Fernley's definition of the wrong crowd. Local residents referred to Bean and his friends as a pack of jackals, who wreaked havoc when they weren't doing or selling substances out of their garage. This havoc often involved intense party and stealing whatever they could to keep their pockets stuffed. On that fateful day in May, Jeremiah Bean intended to do just that. He snuck into the Papes' house and wandered his way through the halls until he came across the master bedroom. There, he saw a sleeping Dorothy Pape face down on the mattress, snuggled up against a pillow. As Bean rummaged through the Papes' dresser drawers searching for jewelry, he found a 22 revolver sitting at the bottom. He held it in his hand, and as he did so, Dorothy Pape began to stir in her sleep. Whether it was a result of anxiousness or his original intent, Bean raised the revolver with a steady hand and fired. Her body went slack against the bed once more. Bean moved quickly to stuff his pockets with necklaces, bracelets, earrings, and other valuables he could get his hands on in the Papes' bedroom. As he did so, Robert Pape rushed back into his home to investigate the commotion's source. As he turned the corner of the hallway, toward the bedroom he had shared with his wife for decades, he was shot as well. Though Robert Papes' last moments were filled with worry, he was spared having to see the brutal fate of the love of his life. Jeremiah Bean had no remorse. After all, it was Friday and he needed cash. Jeremiah did not stop there. However, he did waver. His initial motive for murdering Robert and Dorothy Pape was rooted in needing money. In addition to the pocketed jewelry and revolver, Bean swiped the keys to Robert Pape's truck and left town. He headed down the infamous Interstate 80 toward Reno to pawn off the goods he had stolen from the Papes. With a fresh $1,000 in his pocket, he met up with his Fernley friends to spend the remainder of Friday night in the way they always had party. Jeremiah was generous when it came to his friends that evening. He bought drinks, ensuring his place as the life of the party. He mentioned his day's actions to at least six of his friends, bragging about the success of his looting. Jeremiah partied to his heart's content. In the morning, Jeremiah awoke, feeling rather satisfied and fueled by the notion that his plan had been successful. So successful, in fact, that he realized he could use the already secured pay residence as a source of income for the foreseeable future. 
Throughout the remainder of the weekend, Jeremiah drove back and forth between Reno and Fernley along the I-80, nicknamed the Big Lonely, because the desolate interstate appeared to go on forever with nothing around. On one of his first trips back to the Papes' house in Fernley, Jeremiah grew tired of looking at the lifeless faces of Robert and Dorothy. He dragged their limp bodies across the home's length and piled them on top of each other in a nearby closet and buried them in clothes. Without the decaying witnesses watching him, Jeremiah looted any items from the home that he believed he could turn a profit with. After each scavenge at the Pape House, Jeremiah would return to Reno to pawn off more items for cash. In fact, after bragging to his friends about his Mother's Day weekend antics, they took it upon themselves to raid the Pape residence as well. On the following Monday morning, Jeremiah had another truck full of items that he wished to pawn off in Reno. His greedy nature allowed him to believe that this new routine of looting and selling the late Papes' property could go on forever, or at least as long as he could milk it. As previously mentioned, the I-80 was rather desolate, stretching from Northern California to New Jersey. During his drive along the Big Lonely, Jeremiah realized that the truck he stole from the Papes was low on gas. As he steadily approached Reno, he decided to get off at the Mustang exit, where he had seen a sign for a nearby gas station. Though he believed his gas stop to be well calculated, Jeremiah accidentally took a wrong turn, resulting in his need to get back on the interstate. As he attempted to do so, the Papes' truck became high-centered, and Jeremiah was sufficiently stuck. After attempting to turn over the engine multiple times with no luck, Jeremiah decided to abandon the vehicle. He assumed that he could walk along the interstate and come across a payphone that he could use to call one of his friends to come pick him up. He wandered down the I-80 on foot for about a quarter mile before his stranded state took a turn. Much to his avail, an unsuspecting Eliazar Graham pulled up alongside Jeremiah to offer some assistance. Eliazar, described as an ever helpful individual by his family and friends, had no idea that he was looking into the eyes of a cold-blooded killer. Prepared to provide this total stranger with a jump or a ride if necessary, Eliazar rolled down his window and introduced himself to Jeremiah. Jeremiah had a decision to make. The simple notion that Eliazar had seen Jeremiah's face and noticed the abandoned truck further down the interstate meant that Eliazar knew too much. Jeremiah allowed the small talk to continue between himself and Eliazar for a few moments before slipping his hand behind his back. There, he fidgeted with Pape's revolver that was nestled in the small of his back. Before Eliazar could even process what was about to happen, Jeremiah whipped the 22 out of his jeans' waistband and aimed it at Eliazar. The 52-year-old newspaper delivery man was killed. It was then that Jeremiah knew that he had to act swiftly. Though the interstate was desolate, Jeremiah was not so naive as to believe that it would remain that way for long. He maneuvered himself to the driver's side door of the truck and forced it open. He unbuckled the seatbelt that was supporting the lifeless body of Eliazar Graham. As he did so, Eliazar's body slumped forward onto the steering wheel. Jeremiah caught it and mustered up the strength to drag him out of the seat and onto the hot asphalt beneath him. Jeremiah tossed Eliazar in front of the truck, wherein he quickly hopped into the still warm driver's seat and shifted the gear from park to drive. Without hesitation, Jeremiah stepped on the gas. He waited just long enough to feel both the truck's front and back tires roll over Eliazar's body. He parked the truck once more, leaving the keys in the ignition and hopped out. He dragged Eliazar to the side of the road and tossed some assorted newspaper sheets and a carpet over him to hide his shape. Once he was satisfied with disguising Eliazar as trash, 
Jeremiah jumped back into Elizar's truck and sped off, back towards Fernley. There was no time to follow through with his original plan to pawn the papes' items off in Reno. He realized he needed to dispose of Elizar's truck quickly before someone noticed he was missing. As Jeremiah sped off down the interstate, Elizar was added to the over 500 other deceased individuals abandoned along the I-80 over the years. Just like that, Elizar Graham went from being a warm-hearted, selfless individual to another I-80 statistic. Upon returning to Fernley, Jeremiah turned down Jessica Lane and approached the pape house that had been picked clean. The smell of the decaying bodies of Robert and Dorothy Pape began to flood the hallways and rooms of the abandoned house. Jeremiah drove Eliazar's truck into the garage and removed his belongings from the vehicle, along with himself. He popped the hood of the pickup truck and opened all of the doors before lighting the whole thing on fire. As he watched the fire spread from Eliazar's pickup truck to the Papes' garage walls, he ran. The flames licked the sides of the house quickly in the Nevada sun, spreading more and more rapidly the bigger they became. Jeremiah had been staying with a friend named Patrick Brady on Tamsin Lane a few blocks away from the burning pape residence. When he entered Brady's house, he was beginning to panic. Jeremiah began to realize that his actions were larger than he had initially intended them to be. He confided in his friend Patrick, explaining the details of the crimes he had committed. He recounted murdering Dorothy Pape while she slept, stealing her personal belongings, murdering her husband, pawning off their property, partying in Reno, murdering Eliazar Graham on the I-80, and lighting the evidence on fire at the Pape house. Patrick Brady listened as Jeremiah Bean inadvertently recorded a confession on the cell phone in his pocket. While Patrick and Jeremiah discussed the weekend's events, they noticed their neighbors standing in the backyard of their house a few doors down. Jeremiah realized that they were watching the Pape house burn from a distance. In a panic, Jeremiah dashed out of Brady's house and let himself into the neighbor's home. 67-year-old Angie Duff and her 69-year-old boyfriend, Lester Lieber, remained in Angie's backyard watching as fire trucks continued to flood down Jessica Lane toward the Pape House. When Angie walked back into the house, she found Jeremiah Bean standing in her living room in a blood-stained t-shirt with her 38 in his possession. Upon looking into Jeremiah's eyes, Angie knew she was in trouble. She began to scream as she frantically ran toward her bedroom. Jeremiah fired at the fleeing Angie Duff. She slumped to the floor as her boyfriend Lester rushed towards the back door in a panic. Lester watched Jeremiah standing over his girlfriend from behind the sliding glass door. When Jeremiah noticed him, he fired shots in Lester's direction, shattering the glass barrier between the two of them. It was then that Lester rushed to Jeremiah, attempting to remove the 38 from his possession. The two men struggled with each other for a moment. Lester taking advantage of Jeremiah's scrawny frame until Jeremiah was able to finish off Lester. During the struggle between Jeremiah and Lester, Angie had miraculously found the strength to stand up. In fact, Angie had summoned the courage to rush into the kitchen and emerge with a knife. Angie did not have any real plan, but she knew she had to do something to potentially spare her life and save her boyfriend's. She rushed the sweaty Jeremiah Bean, praying he had wasted all of the rounds. When she got close enough to Bean, she lunged at him with all of her strength. Bean moved swiftly to catch her hand and remove the knife from her grasp. He then finished her off as well. Jeremiah Bean tossed her to the side and rushed out of the house. In a hurry, he removed his t-shirt and ran one door down to the nearest neighbor's home. Their front door was locked and panic had begun to set in for Jeremiah. 
He crouched down and slid his narrow shoulders and slim waist through the half ajar doggy door at the base of the locked door. Once inside, he maneuvered himself into a crawl space above the hallway. Here, in this hot, dusty crawl space, he emptied his pockets of all evidence. He dropped the 22 revolver that had once belonged to Robert and Dorothy Pape, the $1,600 cash he had made from selling stolen items from the Papes, and the 38 he had used on Angie Duff and Lester Lieber. Jeremiah removed himself from the crawl space quickly after disregarding the evidence he had on him. When he reached the living room on his way out of the home, he was confronted by the house owner, whom he had not yet seen. No longer being armed, he ran past the homeowner and dove back outside through the doggy door. With adrenaline pumping through his veins, he made the split-second decision to run back to Angie Duff's home in hopes of stealing a car belonging to her or Lester. He grabbed both sets of keys from the kitchen counter and let himself out of the house through the garage. He realized that Angie and Lester had parked their cars along the street rather than inside the garage. He impatiently waited for the garage door to open enough for him to slide under and abandon the crime scene. Much to his dismay, there were a plethora of police cars parked directly outside that served as a barricade in the event that he would try to escape. The commotion had been so loud and worrisome for the neighbors of Tamson Lane that multiple people had called for the local law enforcement to come to investigate. The second the hot Nevada sunlight touched Jeremiah Bean's skin as he emerged from Angie Duff's garage, he was met with police officers ready to put him in handcuffs. The officers confiscated two sets of car keys from the jean shorts Jeremiah was wearing. Jeremiah Bean murdered five innocent people over the span of a single weekend. His fingerprints were found in the Papes' truck that he'd abandoned on Interstate 80. A quarter of a mile down the road, Eliza R. Graham's body was recovered after officers discovered his pickup truck's remains in the garage of the charred home that had once belonged to Robert and Dorothy Pape. The bodies of Angie Duff and her longtime boyfriend Lester Lieber were discovered directly after Bean's arrest. Their families' lives were irreparably damaged in minutes by a man who had no remorse. Richard Davies, Jeremiah Bean's attorney, remarked that the demon of that methamphetamine is so deeply entrenched in his soul that that is the one he's going to answer to. Davies tried to convince Bean to plead guilty to receive a lesser sentence than the death penalty, but Bean ignored the advice. Davies tried to argue against a harsh sentence, saying that though Bean's rampage was irrevocable and brutal, it resulted from his rough upbringing meth addiction, and below-average intelligence. In under two hours in court, the jury found Jeremiah Bean guilty on five counts of first-degree murder. Prosecutors concluded his trial in stating that what the evidence has shown is that Jeremiah Bean is not a part of a pack of jackals. He is not the center of a pack of jackals, but rather, Jeremiah Bean is a lone wolf. As of September of 2019, the court ruled that Bean's death penalty sentence could move forward. Though the lives of Dorothy and Robert Pape, Eliza R. Graham, Angie Duff, and Lester Lieber cannot be replaced, the city of Fernley can confidently say that Jeremiah Bean will never be able to take the lives of anyone else ever again. <laughs>